table. You know, we are living in a pretty messed up political environment, and we're all trying to process what that means for us as God's people living in America with as bad as it is. But lately, I've been really trying to encourage myself with the fact that as bad as it is here, it's not as bad as it's ever been. That there have been worse situations. And for example, in January of 1649, the House of Commons in England, the lower chamber of their parliament, tried and executed the King of England, Charles I, after a long and bloody civil war. Can you imagine what that would be like if a Congress decided they didn't like the president and they were going to impeach him, and instead of just kicking him out of office, they executed him publicly for the world to see? I mean, that'd be pretty bad. And, you know, as violent as things have gotten, we've not reached that point yet. And so it's not as bad as it's been. But one of the things that I've been thinking about is the day after that public execution, the parliament invited a young pastor named John Owen to come and preach to them. They were all committed Christians. And uh, so he chose a passage from the book of Jeremiah. And basically his sermon in a sentence was, the nation God chooses to bless is the one who walks in obedience to him. And in that sermon, you can find it online, it's got this crazy long title, uh, but he called it a day of public humiliation. And he said this, if by your own personal practice and observance, your protection, your countenance, your authority and your laws, you do not assert, maintain, or uphold the order of the gospel, you'll be forsaken by the angel of God's presence and you will become an astonishment to all the inhabitants of the earth. Now I want you to picture this. 32-year-old guy, he's just a few more months old than I am, standing before not a humble and contrite congregation of people who've just sang their hearts out to God, but to a group of rowdy members of parliament who the day before oversaw the public execution of their king. Now I think about that and I'm like, wow, that is an act of courage. Because in their minds, they had just claimed victory. They were there proud, having accomplished that which they set out to accomplish. Going to establish England as a wonderful Protestant stronghold. But Owen saw it clearly. They couldn't sit back and assume that they had done it. But that if they wanted to experience real success, real blessing, it was going to come as they committed their way to God. Or else they'd end up the same way as the king before them. And so this morning, I just kind of want to, in the spirit of John Owen, remind us as a people, remind our nation, wish our president and presidential candidates were here. I'd love the opportunity to tell them what God thinks doesn't matter how strong or how proud we are and who we are. What matters is our relationship to God. And we're going to see that clearly in the life of Nebuchadnezzar to learn this principle, and I hope you'll take it and apply it to your life, that pride misinterprets prosperity, but humility is a pathway to blessing. And so why don't you open your Bible, if you're not there yet, to Daniel chapter 4. And as you do, I kind of want to set the stage for you. If you haven't been with us the past few weeks, you've may not know how the book of Daniel has progressed. And I kind of made the comment last week that the first half of Daniel is really all about Nebuchadnezzar. Um, But this week's chapter sort of uh, blows apart the mold of the earlier chapters. You know, we've seen courageous uh, acts of conviction from Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's focused on the religious minority in Babylon. But today's chapter is like a letter. It's not like a letter. It is a letter that Nebuchadnezzar sent to the entire empire of Babylon, announcing what God had done for him. See, by this point, Nebuchadnezzar had been on the throne of Babylon for over 20 years, and he had done some really great things. Um, He had restored all the Babylonian temples to their former glory. He had stocked them full of gold and vessels from all around his empire, including the temple in Jerusalem. He'd undertaken some massive construction projects, including the great Ishtar gate. you got to look this up. It was a giant gate leading into the city. It was covered in lapis lazuli, the blue stone that became one of the most precious stones in the medieval world. They used it to make like ultramarine paint, uh, the most expensive pigment anyone could find. And he covered this giant gate in this blue rock and mosaic 
depictions of the Babylonian gods. And it was beautiful. Uh, if you'd seen it, you would have just stood in awe. Of course, he built the Babylonian hanging gardens, which were one of the wonders of the ancient world. He had firmly secured his hold over the empire. There's nobody left to compete with his authority. He was solid. He was set. And he felt good. We open up here to Daniel chapter 4, and we come to verse 4, and he tells us exactly how he felt. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. That's it. Well, man, wouldn't you love to be there? To be at peace in your house and flourishing in your palace. But things didn't stay that way. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies, as I lay on my bed, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them. But they could not make its interpretation known to me. But Daniel finally came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen, along with its interpretation. Now you'll be forgiven if you think like you've heard this story before. This is almost a, a mirror image of what happened before when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and called in his Chaldeans and magicians and diviners to explain to him what he'd seen in its interpretation. But this time, he finally gets to Daniel quickly. doesn't threaten to kill them all. Right? Finally, Daniel comes into his presence. And so he tells Daniel his dream. These were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking, and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong, and its height reached the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. And all living creatures fed themselves from it. I was looking in the visions of my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its root in the ground but with a band of iron around it and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers and the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. What a dream. Maybe you get spun around in the details of what's going on, but Nebuchadnezzar woke up. Whatever that dream was all about, whatever it meant, was frightening. You know, he'd known enough about dreams. He'd experienced their interpretation enough to know something as psychedelic and mind-blowing as a tree that reached the heavens had to be important. But just like that earlier dream of the statue of mixed metals, Nebuchadnezzar can't find within himself his proper interpretation. And so he seeks it out, trying to find some kind of comfort to know what this dream means. Now, from our perspective, the dream's not that hard to explain. You know, maybe it's because we've been raised in the church, we've heard this story before, 
Maybe it's because we have the Spirit of God within us, just like Daniel did. But, you know, we'd like to think that the details of this dream aren't that difficult to decipher. In fact, anthropologists tell us that in the ancient Middle East, trees were a symbol of prosperity and life. They're well known. We think about the Bible talking all the time about the cedars of Lebanon and how strong they are. They're a symbol of strength, prosperity. The man planted by streams of water that produces its fruit in its season, his leaf does not wither, all that he does prospers. This man of Psalm 1 is like a tree planted by streams of water. So the symbol of the tree is not that hard to decipher. Even Nebuchadnezzar has to know that the tree represents life, prosperity, and blessing. But even if he didn't have that, if somehow the king of Babylon schooled and all their magicians and diviners and all that, if he couldn't figure it out, at least he had a word of explanation from a heavenly being. And he talks about this watcher descending. And the watcher word, that word there is pretty important. We don't have time to get into it today, but we're going to come back to it um, when we get to the second half of the book. But an angel comes from heaven and pronounces something. I don't know if you caught that. The sentence is by decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones. The chopping down of the tree isn't to make firewood. It's an act of judgment. Watcher says it's in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on those whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. You know, I'd like to think, if I were in Nebuchadnezzar's shoes, and I had seen that dream and heard the watcher, I'd be able to put two and two together. So then maybe I'm the tree. Maybe I'm the one that's supposed to hear this. Maybe I'm the one who's supposed to learn. This wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's first interaction with the Most High. Last week we saw he acknowledged that the Most High, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had been able to to protect them and preserve them from the fiery furnace he did seven times as normal heat. He'd seen that Daniel had this direct line of communication with a God who could interpret mysteries. Surely he was all ready to hear God's word. But something kept him from understanding. And it was pride. So this morning I want you to know pride clouds our understanding. Nebuchadnezzar knew enough to know that there was something important in this dream. I think he even knew enough to recognize himself in it. He saw that he was the tree that reaches to the heavens. He had a a, a divine blessing in his mind on his kingdom. He knew it reached to the ends of the earth. He saw all the nations that he had subjected. And so he couldn't make two and two come together. How could a king, as blessed as he was by the gods, as mighty and extensive as his kingdom was, how could it ever come to an end? See, Nebuchadnezzar saw himself in the dream, but his pride prevented him from understanding what it meant. And I can guarantee you this morning, your pride will prevent you from understanding too. See, pride looks at our prosperity our accomplishments, our achievements. And it assumes that we're responsible for everything we can see. You know, pride is, at its heart, this inappropriate self-sufficiency that refuses to accept that maybe there's a God somewhere who's given us the things we have. We look at our life and we think that we're responsible for every good thing we see, and it, and it infects everything. I was thinking about this. Pride infects our decision-making. You know, psychologists who study human behavior tell us that all of us, every single one of us, suffer from cognitive biases, things that make us believe certain things. And pride is one of those things. Now, you, you see it, for example, when we see other people make terrible decisions. They cheat on their taxes, maybe, you know, and they get caught. And we think, well, Something like that would never happen to me. Would never happen to me. They were careless. They got caught. But I'll be careful. You know, our pride makes us think that the terrible things that happen to other people won't ever happen to us. That just because things have never happened in the past means that going forward, things 
won't happen to us. But pride also affects our relationships. Do you know the desire to be right, to refuse to admit that you are wrong? Uh, that's the great thing about these cell phones, is that you get into that debate with your wife over what other movie that actor was in. You know, and you say, hey, wasn't he in this? No, he wasn't in that. Yeah, he was. You just pull out your phone, IMDB, and you look up that actor's profile, and you can say, I told you so. Pride affects our relationships. Of course, pride also affects our relationships when things like asking for directions. You know, you, you think about it. I had a pastor who mentored me. He used to tell the story of going <laughs> an extra five miles down the interstate because he was looking for a way to get off and veer back without having to admit to his wife that he really had missed their exit. <laughs> but he couldn't do it. You know, he just did not want to ask for directions. He didn't want to prove that he was wrong. Pride influences our relationships. Those are kind of funny, though. But the one where it really hits home is when we do things that hurt people. We say, I don't understand why you're acting that way. Our pride. How could anything that I ever did cause this much frustration in your life? But pride clouds our understanding. It prevents us from seeing ourselves as we really are. And so it disrupts our decision-making process and it disrupts our relationships. But it also affects our relationship with God. Uh, we could pick back up here in verse 18. Nebuchadnezzar brings Daniel in. He says, This is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, tell me its interpretation. Inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you're able, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Hey, by the way, that reminds me. Somebody found this phone in the parking lot earlier, and Katie is calling. So if this is your phone, um, it was just ringing. So we'll just decline that call for now, and if she calls back, maybe we'll answer. <laughs> but you're able, he says, for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, My lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged, it's you, O king, for you've become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, Chop down the, the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it, and the new grass of the field, and let it be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. That you be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field. And you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and bestows it upon whomever he wishes. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity." So Daniel made it plain to Nebuchadnezzar. He probably knew in his heart that that tree was him and that judgment was coming. But Daniel spelled it out in vivid detail. The dream was a warning of coming judgment so that Nebuchadnezzar would know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men. A day had been appointed when Nebuchadnezzar was going to experience the judgment of God. 
You know, I, I find it amazing. You know, the Bible had no problem, Daniel had no problem acknowledging the greatness of Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. You know, he saw the goodness and blessing in what God had done for him. He saw how the blessings of heaven had flowed to earth through Nebuchadnezzar. The beasts of the field found shade under it. There was food in it for all. It was clear. The Bible has no problem acknowledging that. But what the Bible drives home on people of every time and place again and again is that those blessings come from God and that God deserves our praise. And so in that moment, Daniel made it clear and called on Nebuchadnezzar to acknowledge what was true, that God had done this, and to align his life with that fact. He called him to repent. I, I love the way he says it. Break away now from your sins. Break away. Don't, you know, adjust to it. Don't slowly veer. Break away from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Now maybe God would forgive Nebuchadnezzar for not getting the message of the dream. But here was a clear call to repentance. And just as his pride had clouded his understanding and kept him from seeing, so now his pride caused him to reject the call for repentance. And I'm telling you, every time, that's the way pride works. Pride ignores calls to repentance. So in Nebuchadnezzar's pride, he, he could not accept the fact, could not see himself as God did, as a beneficiary of God's grace and mercy. Nebuchadnezzar saw everything that he had done, and he thought that he had done it. So why did he owe God anything? If ruthlessness could create a kingdom as prosperous as his, why be merciful? So in his pride, he rejected the call to repentance. And it happens the same for us. Our pride refuses to see ourselves as God does, refuses to call our sins, sins. Now Jesus, he dealt with this a lot. The religious people of his day, kind of like the religious people we know, you know, the better than you, holier than thou kind of attitude. And I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 9 to see this encounter he had with them one day. You know, the thing about sinners is they sin. When Jesus started coming and showing mercy and forgiveness to sinners, they didn't change overnight. And that turned out to be a problem. Uh, in this case, in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus saw a tax collector, which to the Jews of the first century was the worst of the worst. They saw them as race traders. They saw the, the Romans as an oppressing, occupying force. And the Jews who agreed to take up taxes from their countrymen for the, the Romans were viewed as just scum. You know, they had uh, sided with the oppressors and the occupiers rather than stand with the people of Israel. But one day, Jesus came and saw Matthew Levi collecting taxes. He looked him in the face, Matthew 9, 9, said, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And this is verse 10. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, I guess that's Matthew's house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, you know, the Pharisees are the opposite of tax collectors. They're the true Israelites, people committed to God's law more than anything you could imagine. They lived and breathed obedience. And so when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. See, pride rejects a call to repentance because pride refuses to see ourselves as God sees us. Refuse to accept the fact that maybe there is sin within me. Maybe this person, this guy who puts on the Pharisee pen every day and makes my public obedience to God a show for everyone to see. Maybe I'm farther away from God than I think. Not probably not. And so when I go pray, I'm going to 
stand before the temple, lift my eyes to heaven and shout loudly, Lord, thank you that I'm not like other men, and I'm not a sinner, and I'm not in need of a Savior, that I'm good. That is what pride does. Convinces us that there's no need for repentance because there's no presence of sin in our life. Oh, the Pharisees were guilty of that. You know, we are, we are too. Uh, it's like this. Maybe you're thinking to yourself right now, man, preacher's really bringing it. Hope my wife's listening. <laughs> you know? Man, I wish so-and-so were here. You, you kind of give them that, that, that elbow. You say, man, this is good. They needed to hear this. That's the same thing. That's the same pride. And the truth of it is, is I am talking to you. Every last one of us. Amen. Scripture says, Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. That's the fact. That's sort of like just the accepted reality for the people of God. But just about the second we think we're getting our sins under control, another one pops its head up like a little gopher. None of us is righteous. No, not one. In ourselves, we've got nothing to commend to the Lord. We may not be at risk of losing our kingdoms, but Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of mankind. And so that's a fact. Here you are today. You didn't think you were going to have to hear all this. But it's the truth. Every one of us ought to break off from our sins and practice compassion, mercy, humility before the Lord. But the uncomfortable truth is that saying this and getting a little teary-eyed, maybe you feel in this moment that, yeah, it's right. I do need to repent. But over the next 20 minutes or so, your pride, maybe even Satan, is going to work on you to convince you that the sins you see in yourself right now and hear the Lord speaking to you and saying, don't reject my call to repentance today. You're going to end up believing that those sins are the exception. Those don't require repentance. Those are character flaws. Those are your, you got that anger from your dad. They're a natural byproduct of your DNA. You're going to live with that the rest of your life. Brothers and sisters, that's pride. Pride rejects a call to repentance. And so this morning, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. Don't let your pride lead you to reject the call of repentance because the result's not good. Let's keep reading. Daniel 4, 28. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace, Babylon. And the king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? You have that scene in your mind? That's almost funny from our perspective to imagine what a king might say as he stands out on his balcony and overlooks the city. You can see the great Ishtar Gate. It's blue stone shining in the sunlight. You can see the gold, the ziggurats, the stepped pyramid temples. This is Babylon the Great that I have built by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. It wasn't a lightning bolt from heaven, but it was a word. While the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And you'll be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately, the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, 
And he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. That final act of hubris, this is Babylon the great that I have built, was met by the fulfillment of the warning. He experienced it. I mean, it is the height of arrogance for Nebuchadnezzar, who never lifted a finger in his life, except maybe on the battlefield, to say that he had built it. Now, it overlooked all the suffering of untold numbers of slaves who built it. It ignored the suffering of peasants. Can you imagine all the peasants and the way they must have been taxed to pay for his construction projects? Think of all the soldiers who died on the battlefield so that Nebuchadnezzar could stand there in his pride overlooking his city. Of course, it ignored God, who had given it to him. God wasn't impressed by Nebuchadnezzar's construction projects, wasn't con impressed by his conquest in the battlefield. God had in his mercy, in his wisdom, in his sovereignty, raised and elevated Nebuchadnezzar for that point in history. And when God said the word, it was gone. See, and this is the most important thing that you have to see this morning. Nebuchadnezzar was the center of his own universe. The one, I love this, from whom, to whom, and for whom all things existed. Nobody else mattered to him. And surely not some God in heaven. Who was he? Here's Nebuchadnezzar, the great, the builder, the hanging gardens of Babylon, the conqueror of the known world. God didn't factor in in his life at all. And that's the problem. See, pride denies the authority of God. And that's why it misinterprets prosperity. It fails to see our world as an extension of his goodness and blessing. So this morning, do not deny the authority of God. It's pressing all around us. You know, we live in an age that glorifies the autonomous self. Each of us is supposedly free to do whatever helps us to achieve this sense of who we are. No social constraints. Surely no biblical doctrines or moralities. Not even biology can tell us how to live our lives. So any conversation that turns to pride automatically comes to hashtag pride. Pride parades. Pride rallies. Pride Month. And if you think about it, it's kind of a natural extension of the kind of attitude that Nebuchadnezzar has, denying the authority of God and giving him the kingdom. And our culture denies the authority of God in determining what's real. The whole LGBTQIA plus movement is an absolute rejection of the authority of God. Do you believe that? It's the truth. But it's not just the homosexuals and transgenders. It's every last one of us. Same attitudes present in the mom and dad who tell their kids, well-meaningly, of course, you can be whatever you want to be. Do whatever makes you happy. Where's God in that? The one to whom, for whom, all things exist is not us. We don't have that. That's God. But of course, in our pride, we refuse to acknowledge Him. The Psalms say this over and over. Psalm 14, 1, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. You know, and that's not just the Oxford-educated atheists that we see on the Science Channel, History Channel, around Easter. The philosophers waxing eloquent about atheism, the vastness of the universe. God's not out there. It's not just the philosophical atheism that says there's no God. It's the daily, practical atheism that's present in the church that lives as if there's no God. That he has no meaningful place in determining what is right in our lives and our thinking. Psalm 10, verse 2 says, In arrogance the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes they've devised. The wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, 
and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. That's pride. I am the master of my faith. I determine what I'm going to do with my life. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. Listen, sin is pride. Every act of sin. Disrespecting the people in our lives. Stealing office supplies at work because it doesn't matter. Pride. What am I doing to hurt anybody? Sin is pride because sin is a rejection of the authority of God. And it's been this way from the beginning. Of course, God created mankind in a place far better than Babylon, the Garden of Eden. Even the way Babylon is described in the dream as a tree filled with fruit for all the living, stretching to the sky, reaching to heaven, going to the ends of the earth. God made a perfect place just like that for people. Put them in it, said, every tree that's here is for your food, except for one. Don't eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But of course, that simple command, which you'd think that our first parents could have handled, wasn't any match for pride. But the satanic whisper, God knows that that's not going to kill you. He just doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know what he knows. He wants to exert control over you. He wants to keep you under his thumb. He just wants all the praise for himself. Why don't you take from the tree and eat and experience the good that God's been keeping from you? And in their pride, they ate. Rejecting the authority of God, living in open rebellion before him, and ever since, we've followed in their footsteps. It's not like it's gotten any harder. He's just given us two big commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But still, those seem oppressive, don't they? To love God with everything I've got, you mean more than this? You insert your own personal idol right there. But that is what it is. Pride is a rejection of the authority of God, and so every sin is pridefulness. So this morning, don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. He pridefully misinterpreted the prosperity of his life to think that he had done it all, that he had accomplished it all, that it existed for him alone, rejecting the authority of God. But then look with me quickly as Nebuchadnezzar experiences a great reversal that holds out hope for us in verse 34. At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised Him and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the kingdom of heaven. For all his works are true and his ways just. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. See, if pride misinterprets prosperity, humility is the pathway to blessing. See, Nebuchadnezzar's pride uh, led to that terrible result. We didn't spend much time on that. But can you imagine hair like an eagle's feathers? That's just kind of a weird way to think about it. It must have looked pretty bizarre, but at the fullness of time, at the end of the times, when the period that God had determined was up, Nebuchadnezzar lifted his eyes to heaven. That, that's like a symbolic thing. Instead of surveying the kingdom that he had built, looking down here, out across the city of Babylon, finally, it kicked in. He learned what he was supposed to learn, and he looked up. He acknowledged God, that God is the one 
who had given it to him. And so he called out to him. In other words, this act of lifting his eyes was Nebuchadnezzar's humble acceptance of his place in the universe. I don't think Nebuchadnezzar was converted. I don't think from that point forward Nebuchadnezzar lived as a faithful God-fearer. But I think at least he recognized that he wasn't as big of a deal as he thought he was. See, if pride is the inappropriate self-sufficiency that rejects the authority of God, humi humility is the appropriate recognition that God is God, and we're not. And because of that, a thousand times over, you can take it to the bank. Humility is the path to blessing. You know, we, we can't imagine that because humility gets such a bad rap. Nobody likes the humble person. We like to think we like the humble person. But what we really like is a person who knows they're all that in a bag of tater chips, and they don't care who else knows it. You know, in ancient philosophy, Aristotle, the father of Western ethics, said that humility was a disgusting display of self-abasement. Quit groveling. You're a man. You deserve the respect and honor that's due to you as a person who's done the things that you've done. Humility has no place laying down your rights, becoming like the doormat that people walk on. We don't like to think about what it would mean to actually live that way. And so we convince ourselves that if we just look out for ourselves and do what we got to do, it's all going to work out. But that never is the case. Humility is a pathway to blessing. You know, as long as we're comparing ourselves to other people, you know, we might can find evidence that we are better than others. But the place where humility really matters is in comparison to God. And in Isaiah chapter 6, we see the example of it. You know, Isaiah, in, in our Bibles, takes up a huge section of our Old Testament. You know, he's a big deal such a big deal, probably there's no Old Testament book that has more scholarly articles and books written about it than Isaiah. It's just a huge deal. Even in his own day, he was a big deal. But after his king had died, he went to the temple to meet with God. And he had a vision of the Lord seated on his throne and the glory and majesty <laughs> of who he is in himself, filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. And Isaiah saw the six-winged seraphim who surround the throne of God there before him. And what did they say? Do you know? You want to say it with me? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's who God is. You walk into God's presence, confront him, see him as he really is, there's no place for pride there. I mean, Isaiah cries out, Woe is me. I'm undone. I'm of a people of unclean lips. My lips are unclean. What can I say to ascribe majesty and glory to the Lord? He's got these six-winged angels who are praising him. All I can do is fall on my face. And when he did that, didn't try to come up with any good prayer, Oh, thou, O oh Lord, art holy above all things. Didn't start reciting doctrine. Well, the holiness of God is the effulgence of his glory. He fell on his face. Humility. And in that moment, he received God's blessing. An angel came, took a coal off the, off the altar, put it to his lips, and cleansed him. My, my favorite example of this humility is in those men who somehow came into the possession of the Ark of the Covenant. And they thought it was going to be this wonderful thing for their town. That if only the Lord's presence was here in Luling, everything would be great. And yet, in that they sought to use the Lord for their own ends, terrible things started happening. And finally they said, somebody come get this Ark. Who's able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Nobody. See, that is humility, to recognize our place, that none of us can stand before him, that none of us has any right to be in his presence. 
That's not disgusting self-abasement. Some people call it uh, worm theology, that I'm just a wicked worm. It's what the Bible teaches us to think. It's the appropriate attitude of a person who recognizes who God is and who they are. And when that reality, when we believe that, that God is God and we are not, it changes everything. It says, I'm not an autonomous self, free to throw off all social constraints so I can become the person I was really meant to be. It says, Lord, what do you want for my life? It offers itself as a slave to righteousness, presents the members of its body as slaves of righteousness. That is what humility is. And we see a tiny glimpse of that in Nebuchadnezzar. See, pride leads us, leaves us to our own resources. Humility unleashes all that God has. We cast ourselves on his mercy and say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I can't, by the force of aggression, the words out of my mouth, get my children to obey me. I can't compel the people in my life to do the things I want them to do. Lord, help me to know how to parent. That's the path to blessing. Not relying on our resources, but trusting in God. And over and over, the scripture promises that the person who puts themselves at his mercy receives it from him. Psalm, 22, or Psalm 25, verse 8 says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. You want to know how to be the person you are meant to be? It's putting yourself into the appropriate order of creation. God is God. You are not. Live accordingly. That's humility, and it's the pathway to blessing. I wish this morning that Donald Trump and Joe Biden were here. Wish every down ballot candidate could hear God's word this morning. Pride says, I've got it figured out. I know what our nation needs. I know. I've got the people around me who have the wisdom and knowledge. They're going to put together the perfect plan to get this virus under control, to get our economy back on track, to raise our people up out of poverty. I'm sorry. We've got enough evidence that the prideful wisdom of men ain't going to get us where we want to go. Humility is a pathway to blessing. Don't sell us a false bill of goods that you're going to solve our problems like Nebuchadnezzar solved all those problems in the Babylonian Empire when they were facing marauders on their western provinces. Yeah, right. What I want is somebody somewhere who's going to say, the path to prosperity, the path to blessing is found when we turn our eyes to heaven and humble ourselves before the Lord. That's what we need. But since they're not here, I want to remind you that humility is a pathway to blessing in your life. Continue relying on your own resources and you'll get the same results. But a humble daily dependence on God is 100%. Take it to the bank. Test it the pathway to blessing. You, you won't have the family life you want by relying on your own resources. But if you try to structure your family and daily seek the Lord together, you'll be blessed. You won't have the internal sense of peace that you're after if you keep trying to figure it out on your own. You want peace that passes all understanding. It begins with prayer. Acknowledging that you don't have the resources in yourself. Bowing your knees. Lifting your eyes to heaven. And saying to God, Lord, you know I'm a mess. You see how my heart and my soul is torn this way and that way. That I've tried to create habits for myself that are going to help me to manage the stressors in my life. I've gotten apps that remind me to drink water every two hours so that I'm hydrated and can sleep better at night. 
Lord, I need you to lead me. That is the pathway to blessing. And so this morning, take a good hard look at Nebuchadnezzar's life. See where pride got him. And see what humility did. And learn. The same for you. Pride misinterprets prosperity, but humility is a pathway to blessing. Listen, I I believe with all my heart that the turn towards God begins by recognizing your sin. Told you earlier, your pride is going to try to convince you that the sin you see in yourself is outside of really God's concern. He's cared about those big sins, the ones that they celebrate in June. But he cares about your sins too. And if you want to experience his blessing, it begins with repentance by acknowledging that you have gone your own way, that you have tried to do it in your own resources. Confess your sin. Acknowledge what God already knows. You've got nothing to hide from him. But repentance leads to something else. Daniel didn't just say, break off your sins. He said, break off your sins by doing mercy, practicing justice. See, God doesn't want a bunch of people who are, you know, pure and holy. He wants people who are committed to living a righteous life. Repent of your sins and ask him to help you follow him, obeying him day by day, living the way he would have you live. That's the pathway to blessing. And this morning, I want to invite you to do that. I want to invite you to repent of your sins and commit your way to God. People express that differently. You know, preachers sometimes invite people to raise their hands and come down to the front and pray with them. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'd love to meet with you after service. If you believe today you need to get on the right path, living for Jesus, pursuing the righteous life, doing things God's way, I'd love to talk you through what that means and what that looks like. You know, other people express it in a different way. They, they'd like to just kneel down at the altar and pray to God. Publicly taking a step out in faith. Believing that if they come down here, it doesn't matter where they pray, they can pray in their seat. But that getting up, doing something that's really awkward when everybody's watching and thinking and talking about them is an important step to get them started on the path right now. Don't wait till after church. Right right now, I need to get on that path. And last week, I kind of did this at the end of my sermon, and somebody told me, I wanted to come down to the altar and pray. And so I'm just going to make a standing invitation that if there's ever a time at Central Baptist Church, whether it's during the singing, whether it's during the sermon, whether it's after the sermon, when you feel like you need to get up from where you are and put your body into motion to express what your heart is feeling. You have the freedom and liberty to do it. Get up from your seat and come pray before the Lord. Don't care about what we think. Do what God is calling you to do. But other people need to know a friend cares. And just like last week, we had our prayer team available in the fellowship hall after service. If you need somebody to pray for you, to encourage you, to hold you accountable to pursuing a life of humility before the Lord. Our prayer team is going to be available after service in our fellowship hall. And they'd love to pray with you. So however you need to obey, however you need to respond to God, can we just quietly do that now? If you need to come and pray at the altar, do that. If you want to come up here and talk to me, just kind of wave at me. I'm going to stand here and then I'll pray for us and then Mike's going to come and lead us in another song.